Now, I believe this book has been so mistaught. Of course, there's many levels of meaning, and I'm just going to show you the level at which I think it should be taught at. I've laid, a, I think, a pretty good foundation. Now, Solomon is not the greatest guy in the world. Okay. One of the things that uh, people don't know is really what this book is called. Actually, there's different renderings. It can be the Song of Songs, which is to Solomon. It could be the Song of Songs, which is for Solomon. It could be the Song of Songs, which is about Solomon. They don't, Solomon didn't necessarily write this. That's what you have to understand. A lot of people think it's the Song of Solomon. It's not the Song of Solomon. It's the Song to Solomon, for Solomon, about Solomon. That's what's important to remember. Now, uh, so Song of Songs 1-1, it's this, I have the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's, but I definitely don't believe it is by Solomon. Now, <clears throat> the best way to understand this book is to think of it as a play, okay? So, let's open the curtains. Dun, dun, dun. This is a dramatic play, and it's going to be in six different acts. And so, what do we have? The first act, and you can write this down, is chapter 1, verse 2, through chapter 2, verse 7. And we see that the Shulamite, or the bride-to-be, is double-minded. She can't decide where she wants to go. Does she want a human king like Solomon, or does she want the shepherd to be her king? And as we know, God never sleeps or slumbers. And you're going to find the bride continually falling asleep, which is representative of the body of believers <laughs> and Israel as well. Okay, act two is going to begin in chapter 2, verse 8, and it goes chapter 3, verse 5. And here we have the shepherd calling the bride to wake up, and we find she does, and then she falls asleep again. And then in Act 3, which is chapter 3, verse 6 through 5, 2, her search begins looking for the shepherd, and she falls asleep again. And then, Act 4, which is chapter 5, verse 3, through chapter 6, verse 10, we see a true repentance. It's not a self-centered repentance. We know there's false repentance and true repentance. And now she has a real heartfelt search for the shepherd. And then that brings us to Act 5, which is chapter 6, verse 11 through chapter 8, verse 4, where she finally works the harvest and she falls asleep again. But this time she falls asleep, not from depression or whatever. She falls asleep because she's been working so hard. Then the last act and the final act, 6, is chapter 8, verse 5 through chapter 8, verse 14. And here, she finally has a concern for others than herself, okay? And she has ears to hear what is going on. Now, the next thing we want to do is we have to know who the cast of characters are in the Song of Songs. So here are the cast of characters. We have King Solomon and his entourage, okay, they're the ones that are surrounding him, protecting him. So King Solomon is in the play. Then we also have the shepherd and the Shulamite, okay? Here's the shepherd. Oh, not that one, that one. <laughs> so we got the shepherd and the Shulamite, as well as her family. Then we also have not only the Shulamite's family, but we also have all the daughters of Jerusalem who Solomon loves. Okay, so now 
Look at Ezekiel 34, verse 31. Now, as you know, God's goal has always been to reach everybody, and everyone's in a different place. That's why sometimes we're considered sheep. Sometimes we're considered fish. Sometimes, I mean, we have all daughters, brides. I mean, we have, you know, sons. But the whole purpose of that is God's trying to reach everyone at a different place. Well, in Ezekiel 34, 31, God says to us, and you, my sheep, the sheep of my pasture are humans, and I'm your God, says the Lord God. Did you know God was known as Israel's shepherd long before he was known as their king? Isn't that amazing? Israel related to God as the shepherd, not as the king. Look at Psalms 80, verse 1. It says, Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you that lead Joseph like a flock, you that dwell between the cherubim, shine forth. So here, even King David recognized God as his shepherd, which is why we all know from Psalms 23, verse 1 through 3, the Lord is my what? Shepherd. I won't want. He's the one who makes me to lie down in green pastures. He's the one who leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness, not for our sake, for his name's sake. So everyone will know he's the great shepherd. But clear back many, 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 about a thousand years earlier in Genesis 49, when Jacob or Israel is blessing his kids, he had this to say about Joseph in Genesis 49, verse 24. His bow abode in strength and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. So even Jacob, long before Moses, 400 years, called God the shepherd and the rock of Israel. So God was known as the shepherd long before he was known as the king. But we also know God always wanted his shepherds to feed the flock. But most have been fleecing the flock. Look at Ezekiel 30. Four, verse 2. He tells Ezekiel, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God to the shepherds, woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? Do you remember in John 21, three times, what did Yeshua tell Peter? Feed my sheep. That has always consistently been God's goal. Now, we know God wanted his shepherds to feed the sheep, not fleece the sheep. And uh, it was not for the shepherds to rule over his sheep. Okay? He claimed that that's what the Gentiles do to their people. The Gentiles rule or harsh toward their sheep. So God is looking for humble people who will serve him and love his people. Do you remember what God told Nathan concerning David wanting to build a house for God? What did he say? He says, you can't build a house for me. You got bloody hands. Look at 1 Chronicles 17, 4 through 7. He said, go and tell David, my servant, so says the Lord, you are not going to build me a house to dwell in. For I have not dwelt in a house since the day I brought Israel up until today. I've gone from tent to tent, from one tabernacle to another, wherever I've walked with all of Israel. Did I ever ask any of the judges whom I commanded to do what? That's what he's commanded them, to feed my people. And he never said, well, how come you haven't built me a house of cedars? And so now tell this to my servant David. So says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, so that you should be ruler over my people, Israel. God wanted a shepherd to rule over his people. Here is David. David was a shepherd who always took care of the sheep. But guess what? Solomon was not a shepherd. 
He was born with a silver spoon in his mouth. He had everything. He never had to experience what David experienced. Now, <clears throat> what you're going to find here, I mean, Solomon uh, wasn't ever trained as a shepherd, never had the heart of a shepherd. And so in the Song of Songs, what you're going to be seeing as we study it is a battle going on between King Solomon and Messiah, the shepherd, and you're going to see the bride trying to decide, does she want to follow a human king or does she want to follow God as her shepherd king? That's what the whole book is about. Yes, it's about a groom and a bride, but it's a bigger picture is Israel wanted a human king and got God so upset. He said, I gave you a king in my anger, in my wrath, I took him away. He was to be their king. And so uh, what's interesting is the Shulamite has to face a choice between King Solomon, who isn't a shepherd, and a shepherd who wants her only to voluntarily join his kingdom because as a king, this shepherd is a melech. He only accepts voluntary subjects. He cannot force the bride to love him. So he has to woo her, romance her, whatever he can do to get her to come back to him. All right. So um, look at Hosea 13.10. This is the verse I just quoted. It's God is speaking to Israel, and he says, Where now is your king, that he may save you in all your cities? And where are your judges of whom you said, Give me a king and princes? And God says, Look, I gave you a king in my anger, and I've taken him away in my wrath. Look at 1 Samuel. Well, look at when this happened. This is chapter 8, verse 5 through 9. God had the people of Israel tell Samuel, they want a king. They don't want God to be their king. And it says, and I said to him, behold, you are old. This is what they said to Samuel. And your sons aren't walking in your ways. So make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. And so Samuel prays to the Lord. And the Lord says to Samuel, listen to the voice of the people in all that they say to you, because they've not rejected me, they have rejected me. So here they are rejecting God as their king. He says that I should not reign over them. According to all the works as they've done since the day I brought them out of Egypt, even to this day wherewith they have forsaken me, served other gods, now they're doing that to you. Therefore, hearken to their voice, howbeit protest solemnly to them and show them the manner of the king that will reign over them. I mean, God is so humble. I mean, if I was God, I'd say, fine, smash him, give him a king, you know. But God said, oh, my goodness, because I'm a Malek, they voluntarily can leave. But I want you to protest. Let them know what's going to happen if they do. And so look at 1 Samuel 8, 15. He's saying, look, they're going to tax you. They're going to take a tenth of your seed, of your vineyards, and give it to his officers and his servants. Wow, how many of you want a government to rule over you? Look at 8, 19, and 20. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, no, we want a king over us, that we also may be like all the nations, that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. Okay, so what the Song of Songs is about, here's the plot. I believe it is a very prophetic story of the Messiah wooing his bride away from wanting an earthly king back to himself as their king. But you're going to see the bride at the beginning is totally self-centered. This whole book is about the maturity of the bride. At first, she doesn't even want to work the harvest. She doesn't want to feed the sheep. She just wants to enjoy the blessings. And then she finally fulfills her calling in being one with the shepherd, and together they work the harvest. That's the good news at the end. So King Solomon now is enticing the Shulamite with everything the world has to offer and wants her to stay with him. She even pursues her in the wilderness trying to get to her while she's going to the shepherd. Okay, and what is happening, the Shulamite is being pulled with those cords of love by the shepherd who wants to be her king. 
Now, there's no way in this story King Solomon and the shepherd can be the same person, which is where everyone's been confused, and you're going to see why. If you look at Song of Songs 1, verse 4, the second half, she goes, the king has brought me into his chambers. She knows who the king is. It's King Solomon. And she knows what he does for a living. He's bossy, all right? But here, look at just a few short verses later in verse 7. She says, tell me whom my soul loves. Where do you feed? Where do you make your flock to rest at noon? Why should I be as one that turns aside by the flocks of your companion? So she's talking to someone who she knows absolutely nothing about. But she also claims to love him. Well, how many believers today claim to love the Lord and they know nothing about him? <clears throat> it's the same. A lot of them don't even know he's Jewish. <clears throat> Let's see. One of the keys to also understanding this is knowing, and you can make marks in your Bible if you believe in making marks in your Bible, who's talking. You have to know who's talking. That's a huge difference. Okay. <clears throat> now, here's the other thing to know who's talking. The Bridegroom always refers to the bride as my love. She always refers to him as my beloved. It's that that it really helps because there are some mistranslations, believe it or not, in the English in this book that we'll go over. Now, look at Song of Songs, chapter 5, verse 4. It says, My beloved. So who's talking? Her, my beloved, put his hand by the latch of the door and my heart yearned for him. That tells you how he always refers to her as my love. Look at Song of Songs, chapter four, verse one. Behold, you are fair, my love. You are fair. You have dove's eyes behind your veil. So do you see that? That's how you know who's talking. And then we also see the daughters of Jerusalem are involved. But look at Song of Songs, chapter two, verse 10. She says, my beloved spoke and said to me. So, you know, that's her. And in verse 10, the second half, what did he say? Rise up, my love. So who's talking? He is. And he says, rise up. That means who was sleeping? She was. See how simple that is. Okay. It's so important to understand this, and I think what's interesting, when we begin the book here in just a minute, it begins with the bride doing all the talking. Yeah, that kind of tells you there's a problem here. You know, we're supposed to hear and obey, not tell him what to do. But oftentimes, when we first come to the Messiah, it's gimme, 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 you do this, do this, do this. And we don't know how to be quiet before the king and see what he asks of us. Okay. Um, okay, let's begin. Are you ready? Song of Songs, chapter one. And let's look at verse one through four. It says, let him, so who's talking? She is. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. She says, for your love is better than wine. Because of the savor of your good ointments, your name is as ointment poured forth. Therefore, do the virgins love you. Now, notice, I find it very interesting. It doesn't say, therefore, I love you. She doesn't claim to love him out of either embarrassment or I don't know what the motive is, but she says, but the virgins love you. And then she says, oh, but pick me, pick me, draw me. And then she says, we will run after you, not I will run after you. She wants to be part of the group. And she says, we will run after you. And then all of a sudden, the king has brought me into his chambers. It doesn't say you have brought me into the king's chambers. It says, oh, the king just showed up and he took me into his chambers. And then she goes back and she's speaking to the shepherd, but we will be glad and rejoice in you. It doesn't say him. It's not talking about the king. 
It says, we're, we're going to rejoice in you. We will remember your love more than wine. The upright loved you. Again, not I love you, but all who are upright love you. And what do we see in Ecclesiastes 7.1? A good name is better than precious ointment, which is what it says. Your name is as ointment poured forth. Look at Jeremiah 31.3. The Lord has appeared of old to me saying, yes, I've loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, well, with loving kindness, I've drawn you. Solomon never showed loving kindness. The shepherd is showing loving kindness. And here, I think it's interesting, you know, how wonderful his name is. Well, look at Psalm 119, 132. Look upon me and be merciful to me as your custom is toward those who, what? Love your name. Psalm 66, 2. Sing out the honor of his name. Make his praise glorious. Well, the shepherd has a glorious name. There's healing in his name. And what do we know? The bride takes on the name of her husband. Well, look at this in Jeremiah 33, verse 16. In those days, Judah shall be saved. Jerusalem shall dwell safely. And this is the name wherewith she will be called. She'll be called the Lord of righteousness. We take on his name. Look at Isaiah 4, 1 and 2. In that day, there will be seven women who are going to take hold of one man, and they say, we will eat our own food and water, wear our own apparel, only let us be called by your name to take away our reproach. And that day, the branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth will be excellent and appealing for those of Israel who have escaped. Okay, we're going to take upon the name of the Lord now. How many know Messiah is the branch? Messiah is the branch. Well, I believe the bride wants her reproach of desiring an earthly king to be taken away. As she returns to the Lord and takes on his name. Look at Hosea chapter 11, verse 1 through 4. When Israel was a child, I loved him. Out of Egypt, I called my son as they called them, so they went from them. They sacrificed to the Baals. They burned incense to carved images. I taught Ephraim to walk. Think about walking in his ways. He taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by their arms. But they didn't know that I'm the one who healed them. I drew them with gentle cords, with bands of love. And I was to them as those who take the yoke from their neck. I stooped and I fed them. And guess what? They rebelled against me. And he's the one who truly loved them. <clears throat> so now let's watch what happens at verse 5 and 6. She is speaking, okay, the Shulamite. And <clears throat> she says, I am black. Oh, but comely, O oh, you daughters of Jerusalem. So now she's not speaking to the shepherds. She's speaking to the daughters of Jerusalem. And she says, as the tents of Kadar, as the curtains of Solomon. And then she says, don't look at me because I am black, because the sun has looked upon me. My mother's children were angry with me. They may be the keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard I have not kept. Wow. And now look at verse, well, let me show you the slide. Here we're going to see, here is Solomon's chamber up there. This is like an old castle. And this is King Solomon's castle. Daughters of Jerusalem, welcome. Come. All right. And so here it's a stormy castle. And all of a sudden, what do we see? King Solomon's castle, daughters of Jerusalem, welcome. And then here are the tents of Kedar, which always were very black. But what she's speaking about is her moral condition. She says, the sun has looked upon me. Israel was always involved with sun worship. This is what that is talking about. Look at 2 Kings 23, 11. 
He took away, this is Josiah, took away the horses that the kings of Judah had given to the son at the entering in of the house of the Lord by the chamber of Nathan, Nathan Melech, the chamberlain, which was in the suburbs, and they even burned the chariots of the sun with fire. So this whole thing, when she's saying, I am black, she's talking about her moral condition by worshiping all of the sun, the stars, the moons, the planets. This is what it is talking about. And we see, finally, 500 years after Solomon, they were still worshiping the sun, okay? And it took Josiah to put a stop to it. Now, look at chapter 1, verse 7. She is speaking to the shepherd, and she says, Tell me, O you whom my soul loves, where you feed, where you make your flocks to rest at noon, why should I be as one that turns aside by the flocks of your companions? You ever look at that? Here she claims to love him, but knows nothing about him. So this cannot be Solomon. And then she wants to come when the flocks are resting at lunchtime so she can have lunch and not do any work. Look at that. And then she has the gall to say, and if you don't tell me, I just may go to someone else. Look at it. That's what it says. I just might turn aside if you don't tell me. Okay, so let's go back to the Solomon's chamber. Okay. And it's lightning. And here she pops out of the castle saying, oh, someone help save me from King Solomon. And so what happens? She goes, ooh, that shepherd boy's cute. (laughs) And and she goes, I love you so much. By the way, uh, what's your name? (laughs) Where do you work? How can I contact you? Uh, What's your schedule? (laughs) And, And so what do we find? It's the daughters of Jerusalem who tell her, In verse 8, well, if you don't know, oh, fairest among women, why don't you go forth by the footsteps of the flock and feed your kids beside the shepherd's tent? If you don't know, why don't you get to work and go follow the footsteps of the sheep? And what's interesting to me, we find in Luke 16, verse 8, that the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. Here she's the bride, supposedly, but everyone else knows all about the shepherd. And hey, if you don't know, why don't you go follow the footsteps of the flock? Now, there's a big question that you're going to see here is, who are the daughters of Jerusalem? What does it mean to be a daughter of Jerusalem? So where do we go to find out? The Bible. Instead of me telling you who they are, let the Bible tell you who they are. Uh, Basically, what you're going to find, the daughters of a city are the new little towns that are produced out of that city. That's what it is. The daughters of Jerusalem are the new little surrounding cities that are built. Let's watch. In Ezekiel 16, again, the word of the Lord came to be saying, Son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations and say, thus says the Lord God to Jerusalem, <clears throat> your birth and your nativity are from the land of Canaan. Your father was an Amorite and your mother was a Hittite. If you remember when Abraham was there, okay, it was controlled by the Hittites, the Amorites. Jerusalem was known as Jebus earlier, It was the mother, look at this, it tells you who the mother was, who the father was. Okay, so we see the father was an Amorite and her mother was a Hittite. They are the ones who founded the city of Jerusalem. So if you remember, before Jerusalem was named Jerusalem by King David, it was known as Jebus. This is where the Jebusites lived. Going back a thousand years before David to the time of Abraham, We find in the story about Melchizedek, Jerusalem was known then as Salem. It was Salem and then became Jebus and then became Jerusalem. And Jerusalem was initially ruled by the Canaanites. Uh, We see the initial founders 
were an Amorite and a Hittite. Now, look at this, Ezekiel 16 and verse 45. You, speaking to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, or your mother's daughter. In other words, you're just like the Amorites or the Hittites. And it says, loathing husband and children, and you are the sister of your sisters. Wow, there's not only daughters, they're sisters who loathe their husbands and children. Again, your mother was a terrorist. That's what Hittite means. And your father an Amorite. Now look at this map here. Okay, so here is Jerusalem. She has two sisters. One of her sisters is Samaria. Her other sister is Sodom. Look at what it says. Your elder sister, that who was founded first before Jerusalem, Samaria was founded, who dwells with her daughters to the north of you. Her daughters are cities around Samaria. And your younger sister, which means Sodom, that city was created after Jerusalem to the south is Sodom and her daughters. That's the city surrounding Sodom. Okay, from this we see Jerusalem's sisters are Samaria to the north and Sodom to the south. Is everyone following? Okay, so as we begin to look through the Song of Songs, I just wanted to kind of give you a basis, the plot of the story, and understand the daughters of Jerusalem are going to be the suburbs around her. The suburbs around Samaria are the daughters of Samaria. The suburbs around Sodom are the suburbs around Sodom. And the daughters of Jerusalem are the little cities, towns, that are just outside and surrounding Jerusalem, okay? But here's what's amazing. Solomon doesn't love Jerusalem. Solomon's love is for the daughters of Jerusalem. The shepherd loves Jerusalem. Do you see the difference here? And when you understand the overarching meaning of this story, it will all make sense. All right, let's stand.